Hello. Um, we're just going to get started in a minute, but for folks who are joining on Zoom, uh, go ahead and drop uh, like drop into the chat your name, where you're from, and also make sure to make your set uh, set your settings to all panelists and attendees, so everyone uh, can see where you uh, who you are and where you're from. Uh, gonna get started in just one second. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get this party started. Um, so first of all, thank you everyone uh, for joining. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ross Morales Riquetto. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Run For Something. Uh, and for those who don't know, Run For Something recruits and supports young, diverse, for progressive folks who are running for state and local office uh, for the first or second time. So I'd like to welcome you to our armchair series uh, where we talk to top practitioners in the electoral space to who give advice on running campaigns, you know, like in a world of global pandemics, systemic racism, police violence, recessions, global uprisings. So like basically just in 2020, um, you know, I'd like to start by thanking a few folks who have made this whole thing possible. Um, the first we've got Act Blue, we've got Ask Me, Authentic Campaigns, Fireside Campaigns, Claire and Steven Crouppen, Onward Together, Yelp, Precision Strategies, and Planned Parenthood. Um, today we are talking to one of my favorite people um, who I often hear through the phone, um, uh, Nick, uh, State Senator, Georgia State Senator Nikima Williams. Uh, she is also, uh, in addition to being a state senator, the chair of the Georgia State Democratic Party, she is also a candidate for Congress, um, and she's here today to talk about vote by mail, GOTV during global pandemic, and like a whole lot of other fun stuff that we'll definitely get to. Um, so, uh, Senator Williams, just to start, I'd love if you could just like introduce yourself to folks and talk a little bit, a little bit about why you do what you do. Hey, Ross, and thank you for having me today. Happy to be here and talk about um, one of my biggest passions, which is getting people activated, engaged, and out to vote. I'm Nikima Williams. I serve as the first Black woman to chair the Democratic Party of Georgia. And I've been serving in the state Senate for the past three years and have the honor of my life just in the past month to be nominated to be the Democratic um, nominee on the ballot to replace my hero, my mentor, my friend, Congressman John Lewis on the November ballot. So um, incredibly grateful for this opportunity, but I know that there is so much at stake and I believe in building power, not just for, for, for power's sake, but for so many people that have been left out of the political conversation for far too long. And that's why I build my power during the day through my day job with Care in Action and the National Domestic Workers Alliance as the deputy director. And I have lots of, um, opportunities to really understand what's at stake in this election. I'm the mom of a five-year-old who just started virtual kindergarten, which is kicking my butt um, two weeks ago. So my little Carter Cakes um, started virtual kindergarten in Atlanta Public Schools. And I truly understand what people are going through in this country when it comes to this pandemic, having suffered COVID-19 myself early March and now um, seeing the impact that it's having on our schools and our economy and everything across the board. So I am happy to be here to talk with candidates across the country about how to get um, their voters engaged, get people um, out to vote in a safe way. No one should have to sacrifice their right to vote or their health during this election cycle. And there are safe ways to do both. So here I am. So to start, um, I'd love to ask, you know, you mentioned Carter um, in, addition, in addition to being a badass and a state senator and a future member of Congress and a chair of a state party, you're also a mom. So I'd love if you, we have a lot of candidates who are moms as well, um, or primary caretakers for children. So I'd love if you can talk a little bit about like being a mom and a candidate. You've been a candidate for two offices so far this cycle. So. Um, what it's like, how you sort of like cope with it, um, 
and any advice you'd give to folks uh, who are going through that right now, especially as we come down the last couple, you know, six to eight weeks of the election? So one of the things that I had to learn early on is I have to bring my whole self to everything that I do. I can't segment me being a woman, me being a Southerner, me being a mom, me like all of these things who make up who Nakima is. I have to bring all of that with me in every capacity that I serve in. And that means oftentimes people give me that little grumpy face when they're like, here she comes with her child at this event. But Carter has, at the age of five, it's probably been to more county party, county Democratic Party meetings than most people that were elected to do that job. And so he fully understands that um, what we're up against in this country and we're normalizing voting to him. One day I was sitting on the porch and he had a little magna doodle and he was pretending to write and he really, he just started kindergarten two weeks ago so he cannot write and send emails. But he said, mommy, I'm writing a note. And the note said, dear all the people of the world, please give my mommy all the votes. Love her son, Carter. So we're normalizing what it means to be active and engaged. And this is something that he is very much a part of. And so I encourage women to bring their whole selves to their campaigns and don't try and segment different portions of your life. For far too long, we've been told that we have to choose one or the other. And I reject all of those notions because we can do this. It's going to take support and it's going to actually take changing some of the systems that exist. I've been endorsed by Vote Mama and um, they are kind of normalizing being a mom in politics and what it means to actually take the FEC up on their regulation to use campaign funds for child care. And these are things that are at the core of who I am. And I, it's not going to be easy, but no campaign is easy, but you do it together and you do it because you understand that elections are about the future and you look in their eyes and understand that we have to leave them something better than what we have right now. Uh, that's awesome. And, you know, one thing that I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about, um, you know, you're currently running for Congress to represent uh, Congressman Lewis's. Uh, seat in the U.S. House. What is, you know, I know that the two of you were close. And so like, what does it mean to you for you to be like running for that seat uh, in Congress right now? So I, um, it was very difficult the way that our laws are structured and having to make the decision to number one, run for Congress and create the process um, and um, decide how I was going to integrate this into my current family life and work life and situation. And I really thought this through over the weekend because it was a very short turnaround while also grieving someone who was very, my husband worked for Mr. Lewis for eight years. And so he was not just um, a national figure to us. He was very much a personal friend and dealing with all of that and understanding all of the things that Mr. Lewis taught us and um, just the legacy that he was leaving behind. And the fact that I, as a black woman in the South, I grew up in Alabama, like I would not even have this opportunity had it not been for the work that he's done. And I felt not only an obligation, but the honor of stepping up to fulfill this role. And I'm on the November ballot, so I still have an election to get through. Um, I'm gonna beat her the Republican that I'm running against. And I take elections pretty serious in this house. So I'm looking forward to that. But I mean, I know that the, the legacy that Congressman Lewis left for us, he taught us that each generation has an obligation to move us one step forward. So we have to not just like continue what he's done, but build upon it and make sure that Carter and his generation is not fighting the same fights and struggles that we are. Yeah, I had a, one of my first campaign jobs, I had a, a like a mentor of mine uh, said to me, either you run scared or you run unopposed. Um, so if you've got an I opponent, mean, you've got to right take it now, seriously. Which is why I'm excited to have this conversation with candidates right now. People are like, why are you doing all of this? Like, it's a Democratic district. You're going to win. I take nothing for granted. Like, we have campaign team meetings daily. We are like, and I'm sure we'll get to some of the tactics and things like throughout this conversation, but we're running a full campaign here 
um, down in Atlanta and we're recruiting volunteers and turning out the vote because I also understand that it's not just about me here in this congressional district, but we have two US Senate seats on the ballot in Georgia. We have the opportunity to flip the state house. And so it is, I have an obligation to do my part to turn out voters in the most democratic seat in the state. Uh, get, actually getting into that, you know, GOTV this year is going to clearly be different than it probably ever has been, uh, at least in the time that I've been working in politics. So like, I would just love to, if you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about it, just like from like a broad perspective, we'll, we'll get into some of like the individual tactics, um, but sort of like broadly, when you think about GOTV, like, how are you thinking about it? What are the things that are different this year? What are some things that are actually going to stay the same? So I think um, the, the big picture thing is people like to focus in on election day. And we have several election days this year. Like we, we have to think about this in the aspect of a global pandemic and how do people vote safely? And the safest way to vote right now is by mail, which is spoiler alert, the same thing as absentee voting, same thing. So we need to make sure that we are getting that information out so that people aren't waiting until election day and then thinking that they can like request a ballot right then. But backing the calendar up and looking at this is when we need to have people request their ballot. So like even, so just thinking about the calendar differently is one big piece. And then not looking at having results necessarily on November 3rd. I like maybe you should wait until that Friday night to have your big celebration to make sure that people have had time to have their votes counted and everything in and um, well big in a socially distanced way because I still want y'all to be safe. Don't go and say Nakima said have this big party. But um, we need to look at just I mean that's the biggest thing looking at the dates in the calendar different It's way more important to have accurate results than fast results. So um, not thinking about election night and knowing exactly where you're going to stand in your race, especially in some of these districts where it's going to come down to the wire on these mail-in ballots. So get ready for the long haul, y'all, because it's not going to be over on November 3rd and it's not going to start on November 3rd. Election day starts in Georgia. Our ballots start um, to be mailed on September 15th. So election day starts September 15th in Georgia. Election Day started in North Carolina on September 4th, so right. it's, we're, we're the election, we're in the election now. Um, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about sort of like the way, like some of the like specifics around like how you work with voters to make sure that they're getting and requesting their mail-in ballots, how you're making sure that you're reminding people to fill them out. How has that changed, you know, like, how would you traditionally do that? And how is that sort of different, like as we're all in the middle of a global pandemic? So I am the queen of field, Ross, and I will tell everybody direct voter contact. We need to be on the doors, more doors, more doors, but that's just not our reality right now. And I had the benefit of, um, I say benefit because it worked my nerves going through it. I had a primary opponent in June. And um, so I, utilized all of these tactics during the June primary when we had our first venture at widespread vote by mail in Georgia. And we were able to, we, we tracked all of the voters and knew exactly who we were talking to and actually expanded the electorate. So in my mind, it's always a good thing when more people are showing up and voicing their um, concerns and getting involved in our democracy. So we expanded the universe, expanded the electorate and talking to more people just by making vote by mail more um, accessible. And we focused heavily on text. Like there are so many people that are not gonna pick up the phone when somebody calls you. I am the worst at that. Like don't leave me a voicemail, but well you can't because my voicemail is full right now. But text me and I will get back with you. And it's the same thing with like making sure that you are reaching out to people who've already requested their ballot to remind them to send it in, remind them to vote for you. But text programs are game changer, especially when you can't talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. And you can reach a lot of people at the same time or at a quicker rate. And you don't have to put people's health and safety at risk. 
Um, we got a couple questions from uh, folks on the Zoom. Um, the first is like, I like, you know, is asking about resources that you might use or that you know that are out there to share with voters, basically to help educate on the dates uh, that they like need to be thinking about for sending in those vote by mail applications, requesting ballots, et cetera. So I um, mentioned earlier that I'm the chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia, and we were the first state party in the country to have a full-time voter protection team. And we say that a lot because we have really pushed other states to do the same. And so now state parties, especially in key states all across the country are building up their teams in conjunction with um, other partner organizations and really doing the educational work. If you go to your local state party's website, they should have information on um, vote by mail and how to request your ballot and all of the details and information surrounding it, all of the, the legalities, the dates, everything. And also um, coming up soon, launching this week, um, Care in Action is going to be partnering with some other organizations where we will in real time through social media platforms, answer questions to make sure that people are getting the information that they need. We have to meet people where they are. Lots of questions are gonna be happening. We have lots of celebrities that have gotten involved and I appreciate it in the voting rights sphere. And now it's up to us, the practitioners, to make sure that people are getting the accurate information that they need. So reaching out to um, your local state party, organizations that you trust that work in democracy work um, are all key to getting the information to vote for, for voters. We got another question in from, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce your name. Uh, I think Mehrani, um, you know, are there, you know, this is actually something that a lot of our, I've heard from a lot of our candidates, which is that because we're not able to get out on the doors right now, um, a lot of our phone data and information isn't the greatest. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case specifically with the Georgia voter file, but oh, it's a um, concern all across the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know a lot of states are having that as a concern this cycle. So, what are you rec like? What would you recommend for candidates who are trying to get like the phone like to supplement their phone data like from the voter file right now? So, I mean, you have to use that information and try and clean it up. The voter file is only as good as we make it. So I encourage candidates to actually utilize the voter file, actually enter their data so that you have clean data for your next campaign, um, but also building organic lists, um, not being afraid to do the work to build your list and working with other organizations who are already supporting you because those lists might be available you, and some of it you have to pay for, some of it can be in kind to your campaign, but asking, don't be afraid to ask groups that have endorsed you. Um, I am kind of, I, I'm collecting endorsements right now and every organization that endorses me, we, we're not gonna talk about endorsements, Ross, um, but every organization that endorses me, I ask what, um, like, what does this endorsement mean? And some of that means they can send out something like a link to your website so that their supporters can then sign up and get information directly from you and you can capture that information. But don't be afraid to ask organizations to that are supporting you to do things on your behalf. So some states, uh, also I love the shade. Um, some, states, <laughs> some states allow you to early vote uh, and vote by mail and they'll have drop boxes and in-person voting locations on election day. For folks who have a variety of options in their states, like what would you tell someone about voting by mail versus early voting uh, versus like voting in person versus like going to a drop box? What sort of like the high, like the, the order that like we wanna like be talking to voters about what they should be doing? So the number one safest way to vote during the pandemic is voting by mail. That is the safest way. We know that there are a lot of trust issues with our governments. I mean, I live in Georgia, so you don't have to tell me that there are some trust issues with um, the people who are administering our elections, Brian Kemp. But that's um, but we are people are doing the work to mitigate that risk. 
um, and to mitigate the problems and the voter suppression that we've all seen across the country. So um, that is where I will start. I will always encourage people to do the safest thing because I, again, understand how difficult and scary it is to suffer from COVID-19. And I don't want to put anyone through the same thing that I went through in March. And then after that, Georgia also has early voting as does many states. In early voting, you can kind of schedule it out around a time when there are not many people there so that you are doing this in a safe way. We, um, a lot of the sports arenas are now hosting um, early voting sites so that you have large spread out space to go and vote. I um, voted in August 11th on our, for our runoff election for the primaries here in Georgia. And I voted at the State Farm Arena where the Atlanta Hawks play. And it was like an experience. You go, they even made our little peach I voted stickers look like a basketball. So, um, but there is so much space because you could spread out on the floor of the arena, all up in the concessions area. And it gave people an opportunity to number one, make voting an experience. Number two, you knew that you were going in and you could track that vote because it's early voting. And um, for people who had fears around the mail-in process. And then election day, I am always gonna fight to make sure that those people who want to show up on election day have the opportunity to still do so safely. It is the job of our states to make sure that no matter how you decide to vote, that you're able to do that efficiently and safely. So I, while I will encourage people to do the safest, I want to um, make sure that people understand that no matter how you choose to vote, it should still be safe and we should demand that our states make that possible. I love that. And yeah, I mean, I went and voted uh, in Washington, DC. Jeff and I both voted, my wife and I both voted. And um, luckily the polling location is a block and a half from our, uh, our house. Otherwise we might not have been able to vote because we requested our absentee ballots and they never, they didn't show up till Saturday. Um, after the election, and that's in Washington. After the too, election. So. After the election. So. so the same thing happened in Georgia. Our primary was delayed not one, but two times, delayed twice. And I requested my absentee ballot in March. I still haven't received it. And so I went to vote on the last day of early voting, waited in line five hours on my 10 year wedding anniversary to cast my ballot in the primary because I was not going to miss the opportunity to vote for myself. I mean, voting like in a wedding anniversary go seem to go hand in like seem to be I mean, great it was, for it me, was on but... brand for who we are as a couple but <laughs> I was a little hot that I had to wait in that line for five hours and then it rained and then Leslie got his ballot but I didn't get mine so and then the drop boxes weren't at the early voting locations so then he had to drive around and find an early voting location but at the end, it all worked out. We had a DJ playing at the early voting location to keep people motivated. I mean, we got to make it fun. So we brought folding any means chairs. necessary. <laughs> we brought folding chairs and some food. And if you're going to go vote in person on election day, you should probably do, you should do the same thing. Um, a question we got from Jennifer, and actually, I mean, truthfully, I actually don't know the answer to this question. Um, you know, how, how would you go about coaching voters um, or talking to voters about making sure that like signatures match, like what they probably gave on their voter registration application versus like their vote by mail application? It seems like that's been a problem and that seems like a really easy way to, you know, for Republicans to invalidate, um, you know, Democratic votes. It, it has been a problem. And um, just this weekend, I was talking to my father-in-law. He went and took his ballot in, his um, absentee ballot. He was um, recounting the conversation. And his name is Daniel Leslie, but he signed it Daniel L. Small. And they were asking him about the middle name and like why it wasn't there. And he's like, because I didn't sign it there. Like, And so like you often don't remember that. So that's one of the things that we... Um, there are multiple lawsuits right now to make sure that things like um, signature matches and exact matches, when you register to vote at 18 years old, I have had, I've reinvented the way I sign my name so many times since I turned 18. I've reinvented it now signing thank you cards over the past two months, how I sign my name. So, but it, I am still Nakima. And so that's one of the things that we are still dealing with because unfortunately so many ballots have been 
um, kicked out for signature matches is still a problem. Yeah, and in some states you can check, you have the ability to check whether you're like what the status of your like ballot is. So like if you're in a state that allows that, I would make sure folks also do that. It's not, you can't do that everywhere, but if you are in a state, that's a, that is like one thing that you can do. And that's um, one of and the you, benefits of early voting and voting by mail is that in some states you can track it, but you can't do that with election day. And I like to like check and see like that it stays accepted and counted and the date. So um, that's, that's one of the pluses for voting early or voting by mail. Totally. Um, all right. So you're like running a GOTV operation in this environment, you know, especially, you know, like from the polls that I've seen recently, Democrats are trending towards having a preference for voting by mail. Um, I would love to hear when you're thinking about putting together like a vote by mail program, like what are the things that you're thinking about and sort of like what recommendations and advice would you give to candidates who are currently, you know, maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks away from ballots dropping? So I would say for down ballot candidates, I would not spend a lot of money on doing the actual mailing out the ballot request myself because we're going to hope that you have a very good state party chair and other leaders in your state who are doing this at the macro scale. And then your name is gonna be on that ballot, but you should be able to see um, like the ballot request for your district. And then that's where your tactics come in of following up with people with your, um, with text messages or calls. However, if you can, um, get a text program, that's great. If all you have are volunteers to do call lists, that's great as well. But those are um, the most efficient ways to do the chase program to, and then you know exactly the electorate that you're talking to and who's voting early and um, taking those people off the list so that if you do a traditional mail program, you're not wasting money in talking to people that have already voted. A visitor. <laughs> Sorry, that's Mr. President, and sometimes I'm, I mean, Nikima, I'm sure you're familiar with I've met with Mr. Him. President. <laughs> um, on, on many conference calls. Um, sorry about that, <laughs> folks. Um, when, you know, there are a lot of different options this year um, for voter contact work, like, especially as we're getting closer to election day. Can you, can you just, like, talk through what especially like now that we can't be on the doors, like what are some of the different options for folks and what are some of like the benefits and sort of like the downsides of like the different types of voter contact that we have available to us right now? So one of the things that I keep getting is people still want to go to doors. And so I, um, so thinking about how to do it safely, you can't just tell people no, no, no all the time. You have to like, okay, well, how do you do what you want to do safely? I look at it, um, and this is probably going all out of left field, but so I spent 10 years of my professional career at Planned Parenthood. So instead of just abstinence only, like how do we make sure that we are doing this in the safest way possible? And so we've, um, we're working with some um, team leaders who want to still go out to come up with a safe way to do targeted lit drops and getting things out to voters. Um, so we still have our traditional um, list of voters in targeted neighborhoods, but we are not having direct conversations with voters, leaving the information on the door, um, knocking and leaving so that the information is there. And then um, some people, some groups who um, are still stepping back with their mask and um, gloves on and still doing some socially distanced conversations. One of the things that um, some people in my neighborhood have decided that they want to do are porch parties where there are 10 or less people only outside, no indoor events, but bringing people together to um, on the street. And so having multiple houses in one neighborhood to have only 10 or less people at their house and go house to house to meet people um, in a socially distanced way. And foregoing campaign t-shirts for campaign mask is one of the things that, um, and it saves you money, masks are cheaper than t-shirts. Um, but also looking at 
um, making your Zooms fun, making your Zoom gatherings more of social events and making your text parties fun and socially active so that you're not just sitting in a room by yourself doing the text. And so we have like text bingo when we're texting voters to make sure that people are engaged and we're doing it um, on Zoom so that it is a social affair, but we're still very targeted with what we're doing and keeping people safe in the process. And how are you, how are you thinking about like, especially, you know, how are you thinking about like candidate time right now? So like, what is, what should like, a, what should the candidate be doing, especially around early vote? And then especially as we get like to election day itself, like how should candidates be spending their time um, being safe and socially distanced? So I will say that in my primary that we just finished, I won, I got 77.53% of the vote and I never left my house. I didn't do not one in-person event. And so there is a very safe way to do this like by staying home and still doing direct voter contact. And we increased the electorate, but we had a, um, like once at this point, your campaign plan should be set. And I would say sticking to the plan and making sure that you are utilizing your time, reaching as many voters as possible. And you're probably gonna reach more voters now through um, Zoom and digital methods than you were before because you can cover so much more territory. But making sure that you're trusting the plan that you have in place and continuing to expand the electorate, reassuring um, those voters that already support you, making sure that they not only support you, but they're turning in their ballots that, I mean, the vote by mail chase program is um, the biggest thing that you can do because we know that more people are showing up to vote by mail than in person. And you know that people have requested these ballots, so they are planning to vote. And like pulling that list and making sure if you can make phone calls to those people or if you can um, find a way for you to just sit there and spend as much time as you can calling back through that list, then that is um, a huge benefit. I, um, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about this from like the down ballot level because I don't know that I would be able to call myself every voter that pulled the list in my congressional race, but, um, and Maria's probably looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm saying all of this stuff, but, um, and then I'm gonna try to do it myself. But I, I mean, I think that you also have to make sure that you understand that no one has ran under these conditions before. And so you don't have to know everything and give yourself some grace in this moment and make sure that you're taking care of yourself because there are some long days ahead and it might feel hectic right now, but boy, oh boy, it's going to get a little longer and, um, and you have to give yourself some grace in this process. We got another question uh, that just came in from Naomi, which is, I like, really like this one. Like, what are some of your favorite virtual ways to engage with uh, your volunteers right now? Um, so I, I love, um, like, I love text parties. And like, just, I mean, having everybody on Zoom, though, and just, and being able to, like, talk about the conversations that everybody's having in the moment and keeping people engaged like while it's happening and having the candidate, like I love surprising a voter when um, the pre-populated um, text is like, hi, I'm a volunteer with Nakima for Congress. And I'm like, and this is Nakima. And they're like, is this really Nakima? I'm like, yeah, it really is. So I, I love being able to have the, the actual party. So you get the camaraderie and you're, um, like able to feed off of each other and I might be a slightly competitive and so I love to have a game connected to it um so that you're able to win something like whoever gets the fills the bingo card first or whoever has the most um right now I have this big kick on yard signs but I want them in yards not in intersections because those are also voters and so whoever gets the most yard signs at the end of our text party gets a prize and so coming up with creative ways to keep your make sure your volunteers know that you're doing the same things that they're doing and you need them and keeping it fun because you're going to need them for the long haul are you a thermometer person that I found that in politics, there's a divide between thermometer people and non-thermometer people. I want a thermometer. I have been 
preaching about this thermometer that is supposed to go up on the wall. Maria is sitting in the over here laughing now because I want a thermometer so that I can track everything, but I still don't have one. One of my old bosses, Paul Tews, always used to yell at me because I like, I'm not, I'm just like, it's not how I, it doesn't do anything for me. Um, but he would scream at me because like I hadn't, he would be like, make the thermometer and you know, like I do other stuff and he would be like, no, the thermometer is not made. He'd run into my cubicle and scream until like, I was like, all right, I will make you this fucking I'm thermometer. still waiting on my thermometer. I need this thermometer and it is not done. Maria, I can't see you on this, but I, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> I relate. Um, you know, I think a lot of voters are going to be filling out mail-in ballots for the first time ever uh, this cycle. And so how would you like coach a campaign um, to like start to think about like how they're having those conversations with voters to make sure that they fill out those, like first they fill out the applications so that they get a ballot. And then secondly, how to make sure that they fill out those ballots correctly. I've seen some really cute videos where people have just like actually recorded step by step in the process on how to do it, like from the point of getting it out of your mailbox and doing the infographics um, have been the most creative ways to like talk people through it when I legit in March was the first time that I ever even thought about voting absentee or voting by mail and I was like confused and had to go online and I was like I don't even know how to do this and now I'm like the queen of preaching to people about how to vote by mail and March I was a newbie and had had to look it up myself and figure out how to even do it but the infographics have been very very um helpful and making sure that you can push that out through um, digital. But make sure that you're not just talking to the masses. You're running for local races, you're running for state rep, state senate. You don't need to talk, like, I, my, I don't need to talk to you, Ross, you can't vote for me. So make sure that you are putting your voter foul into Facebook, like dropping it in so that it's targeted and you're not just talking to the masses. I'm not trying to educate everybody. Plus the laws are different. So make sure that you're just, you're targeting your people. I would vote for you if I could. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a really specific question from Jennifer about Georgia. Will anyone be tracking Georgia post office mail delay times starting on October 1st so we know uh, when to stop sending in ballots. So we are check, tracking this through our voter protection team. And right now we have, we don't have an exact cutoff date um, for requesting or sending. We, because our ballots have not been yet mailed yet. And so the first ones are set to be mailed on September 15th. So we're waiting to see like what that timeline is for the first um, batch of mail. But um, because what we know is during the primary, our ballots were mailed from Arizona. So I request a ballot from right here in downtown Atlanta. And it went to this firm because in their infinite wisdom, our secretary of state decided to contract with the firm out of Arizona to um, mail ballots. So the mail was already a little delayed. COVID was already a problem. And they decided to mail our ballots from Arizona. So we are mindful of that and because the first batch is not hit yet we're not certain of an of an exact date got it you know as the chair of like a state party like you see a lot of down ballot you know like candidates running um and you know like as a part of being as a part of care in action i'm sure you've also seen folks from all around the country as well what are what are some of the like pitfalls that you've seen or like some of the mistakes that you've seen folks making um, as they get ready for GOTV um, in a year where honestly like nobody knows anything? Yeah, I think the biggest thing um, like throughout the process is like having the overthinking that like there's only one way to win elections and that's by voter contact. And so a lot of things are nice to have, but keep asking yourself, how is this getting another voter to the polls that is voting for me? And I have to remind myself of that because I like all the nice shiny things 
but I have to reel myself back in. Like, is this really going to get this? Like, how is this getting a voter to the poll? And if it's not doing that, then you should probably pass on it because you only like we know that there are only so many people that can vote for you and you need to be focused on that so um staying focused not it i mean i would say ignore your opponent because my opponent whew, it can go down a rabbit hole real quick because she is an interesting person but staying focused on your race, running your race, you know why you got in the race in the first place, you know why you're running for office, and you know the change that you are seeking to do for your community. So staying focused on that and not allowing somebody to get you um, sidetracked, including your opponent. Got it. We have another question from Naomi, um, which is specific, you know, to being a parent, caretaker, and a candidate. What is the best advice for how to set boundaries while campaigning? So that is, that works both ways. You have to set boundaries for the campaign and for the family. So like um, making sure that you rely on your support system and having a support system. Like there are gonna be a lot of people that ask you what can they do to help you? And sometimes that is like, can you sit with Carter and play Pokemon while I like go through like this other stuff that I need to do or I get these questionnaires filled out, keep him occupied so that he doesn't feel neglected during this process. So leaning on your support system, um, my I would not be able to do this without my husband. He steps in when i mean he is not stepping in when he's the parent as well because dude it's your job too but he i mean pulls more than his weight in our house right now um you know one thing that i think is always interesting and i think is different for every candidate and campaign is sort of the relationship between candidates and their state party what advice would you, as having been a candidate and a head of a state party, like how, what advice would you give to candidates on forming a relationship with their state party um, and interacting with them in like the most productive way possible? So um, I would say that my best advice is most state parties are run by volunteers. And so the best way to change your state party or to get the party to do what you want them to do is to get involved. That's what I did. I don't get paid a penny to be state party chair. Um, it is the most um, difficult volunteer task that I've ever undertaken. <laughs> but even our county party chairs across the state, Georgia has 159 counties and all of our county party chairs are volunteers and they welcome you to come and get involved even as a candidate and making sure that you are reaching our base, our I mean, the party volunteers or those people that you know are going to be there and have your back because they are like they're involved no matter when the polls are open and they're doing this work because they believe in our democracy. They believe in the Democratic Party. But um, getting involved with the county party is a, the first huge step. And what advice would you give for folks like interacting with their state party? Um, especially after they've like, you know, filled out their paperwork, they're on the ballot. Like, how do you make sure that like that relationship like is like helpful, honestly, for like in both directions? So I get a lot of questions the state party chair, people will call me. So pro tip, probably don't call your state party chair and think that they're gonna just run your race. It's your race. Um, but ask for advice and ask for, um, like state parties should be investing in vendors so that you can get discounted rates to services. So calling and introducing yourself, I sent a letter to every Democratic candidate who won their primary and those who ran in a primary and didn't quite make it. Number one, asking them to stay involved with the party if they weren't successful in their primary. And number two, like making sure that they knew that we wanted resources to be available to them. My job as state party chair, I've taken on to make sure that we could um, have an infrastructure in place so that anyone who wanted to run had the opportunity to do so. So many people aren't able to run because they think that you have to be like, check all the boxes and have done all the things before you are able to be a candidate on the ballot. But some of it is demystifying um, 
like what it means to be a candidate. And so we have um, done so much outreach through our candidate recruitment program and just we are hosting um, Zoom parties with our vice chair of candidate recruitment for the DPG where she does a weekly happy hour to bring candidates on to introduce them to other people in the democratic community. So stay um, alert for emails that are coming from your state party for officers in the party that are hosting events and people will be happy to introduce you to other leaders in the community so that you can expand your network, expand your universe and win on election day or whenever the votes are counted. <laughs> That's actually a great segue into my next question, which is people have mailed in their vote by mail ballots. They've gone to vote early. They go and they vote for whenever the polls are open until whenever they close. What, like, from your perspective, what is election day going to look like? What should people expect on election day? Um, and any, like, possible advice that you'd have for folks who are sort of, like, trying to navigate the morass of, like, everything that's going to be coming out, like, on election day? Um, I, I know that there are people out there who want to... Um, to create confusion and chaos in our electoral process. So be mindful of that and understand that they do not have your best interest at heart. And they are probably not the people that um, are encouraging people to show up to vote for you. Continue to, with your plan and contact your voters on election day to remind people when the polls close, if they have not turned in their ballot, if they're, um, if, if it is permissible in your state, use a drop box to get those ballots in or show up to vote on election day. Make sure that you have maybe PPE equipment available for people, mask and gloves or, um, and encourage people to glove up and mask up and go and cast their vote before the polls close. But also change expectations now so that people aren't expecting to have results immediately when polls close because this is a very different election. And just because polls are closed does not mean that all of the votes are counted. We need to normalize counting all of the votes in an election. Um, I am very familiar with this coming off of the gubernatorial election in 2018 in Georgia and what happened with Stacey Abrams and the, the days after the election when I am used to sleeping in the next morning and like just waiting for everything to be announced. Um, we were still doing provisional ballot chases and trying to find out who had not voted. And so that was, I mean, that election did not end on election day. And then um, a week later, I ended up being arrested in the state capitol because activists were demanding that every vote be counted. So let's um, get away from the notion that just because we have a date on the calendar for election day, that that's when we're gonna know the results from all the races. Because we don't want people to say just because we don't know or we might find out later that those aren't legitimate results. Everybody's voice deserves to be heard. So let's make sure that we're counting every vote. So normalize that with your supporters and have that expectation on election night when you're doing your returns party or whatever you're doing on election night. Um, have the understanding that you're probably not going to find out the results on November 3rd, and that's okay. Yeah, and on top of that, we're probably not going to know the results on election night, and to be honest, we'll probably be down on election night. So also, like, if you're just watching the election returns, like, don't, like, lose hope based on what you see on election night, because more Republicans than Democrats are likely to vote on election day, which is just like to say that out loud is just like mind blowing because it's not normally how it works. Right. Uh, but that's the way we live in an upside down world. So that's how it's going to work. And uh, we don't know year. which votes they're going to count first, like different states or even different counties within a state are some like might report election day ballots first. Some might report early voting first. And so knowing that that all of the votes are equal and waiting for them all to come in is the important thing. Accuracy is important, expediency, not necessarily. There's even a handful of states that aren't, where folks aren't even allowed to start counting ballots until 
after the polls have closed, like on election day. So those votes are not going to get counted that night, probably. So like, it's just like important to remember that whatever we see when you go to bed on election night, that is not the outcome of the election. We need to, as Senator Williams has been saying, we need to be patient um, and let the process play out. Um, we, uh, Senator Williams, uh, will have to go uh, a little bit before seven. So I'm going to do our last question now, uh, which is what is the best advice that you've seen given to a candidate? And then also what is the worst advice you've ever heard someone give to a candidate or maybe that you've received as a candidate? Um, the best advice and the worst advice kind of go hand in hand. Um, the best advice is be you. People want authenticity. They want to see who you are. They want to see real people. Um, and the worst advice that I've had. So I was running for office and a group had endorsed me and Ross, they told me that I should put my name as Nikki instead of Nikima because I would get more votes in certain parts of the district if I use Nikki. Well, my mama named me Nikema and I use Nikema on my signs and on all of my campaign literature because that's who I am. And it goes back to that authenticity thing. Be you and don't be afraid to be who you are. I often say that I live my life out loud and on purpose and I encourage you all to do that because you're running for a reason and people, you've gotten this far for a reason. So continue to be who you are and allow people to vote for you. All right, I kind of lied. You answered that question really fast and then I got one more question. No problem. So everything on election night goes really well and through the election, people are allowed to count their ballots in Georgia, like as they cast them, people come out and vote they don't get turned away at the polls. This is my what, utopia. I know. What what do we what does Georgia look like after like on January first in that scenario? Oh my gosh. So I like to do this front page scenario. I'm like, so and I backwards calendar. So tell me what do you want the newspaper to say on November 4th? And then, okay, well, you, knew, you know what you need to do to get there to November 4th to make this headline your reality. So my utopia and what, I, what Georgia looks like, we will have flipped the Georgia House of Representatives. It is critical that we do that work to flip the Georgia House of Representatives so that we have a say in the redistricting process and not leave us out of the conversation for an entire generation, an entire decade. So um, Georgia will have a Democratic state legislature and um, I will be referred to as Congresswoman Nakima Williams and I might be your neighbor in DC, Ross, for temporarily. And we are also like for the first time since um, 1992, Georgia will have gone blue for the presidency and decided the balance of the United States Senate by sending two Democrats to, to the United States Senate. I love that. And I think that's where we want to, I think that's where we definitely want to end this. Um, but it's a beautiful vision. Thank you, Senator Williams. Thank you so much for being on. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone who's watching. Uh, this has been so much fun. Um, you know, to folks who have been tuning into the series, we have one more armchair chat uh, left in the series next week. On September 16th, uh, we'll be doing uh, a session on video storytelling with Taylor Benke uh, and Alan Piper from Now This. So if you are interested in video, um, especially doing it, you're learning how to do it yourself, like please like sign up attend on Facebook, you can sign up on Zoom. Uh, and with that, just like thank you everyone and thank you Senator Williams for your time, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ross. Take care.